Greetings, everyone. Welcome to your affirming interfaith community. We are Swedenborgian Community Online, hoping to uplift you wherever you're at, no matter your faith tradition, what you call your higher power or not, uh, or walk in this life. Uh, but we are grounded in a mystical Christianity called Swedenborgianism, which uplifts those ideas, uplifts the idea that God, Goddess, is alive in all things, in all uh, forms, in all goodness and life. Uh, and that God as uh, Christ uh, very clearly uplifts this idea that we should be open and supportive of the stranger, loving and supportive of others, but also that God speaks to us in many different forms, in many different scriptures throughout time, and that she is always striving to pull us closer to her in health and wholeness and joy and in uh, life. So uh, we're happy to connect with you whenever we do connect with you. But for those of you who catch us live on uh, Sunday evenings when it's just the audio and we've been a podcast for a long time. So I, the podcast is a special place in my heart. I uh, welcome you folks and, and hope you share your, your thoughts in the chat see as we continue along. Uh, if you catch us on YouTube or, or if you like video, please subscribe because it's kind of our newest effort and it's a cool way for us uh, to uplift each other. If you ever have any feedback or want your voice heard, reach out to me and let me know. Uh, connect with the community at SwedenborgianCommunity.org or on Facebook and uh, we'll be sure to try to uh, uplift your thoughts and uh, have, have fun and uh, health and community connection. So today we're talking about uh, a topic called to be or not to be, being faithful to life or to worldly success. Now, as I think you'll find when we turn towards our reflection, uh, worldly success isn't of itself a terrible thing. It's just when we center ourselves on that high of vanity, of pride and selfishness, we find that we aren't being faithful to the life within and around us. We're not being as supportive of others as we could be uh, if we're dominating, if we're hurting others, if we're uh, riding that selfish wave. And truly, we're called by most of the world's scriptures, uh, from the Vedic tradition, uh, Hinduism, to the Quran and others, to be good, to be humble in our walk. It may sound uh, kind of off-putting sometimes, this call of scripture towards humility. Uh, we even make fun of those who, who work on their humility, or at least mention that they do, um, and, and things like that. But really, it's, it, it's a valued uh, substance of our spiritual life. It's a valued mode of being, not just uh, by scripture, but in the world. We, we appreciate the people who are willing to uplift others, uh, who recognize that all things are gifts and, and behave <laughs> that way. So today, let us uh, reflect on this idea of being and not being, of being faithful versus being uh, centered on success and whether or not these are similar things. And let us also be present to truly just be in the moment, taking some deep breaths, a few seconds in, a few seconds or more out, reminding ourselves of our spiritual practices that we want to employ more regularly, maybe taking a baby step towards doing them more regularly. It helps me when I actually put my spiritual practice on a calendar. <laughs> uh, things like that, just kind of hack, hacking our lives in a sense to make it work for us so that we can be faithful to, to not only the life around us, but the life within and, and our family. Thinking about the ways that we could be more faithful to our family and our, our source. Um, and our source takes many manifestations, so also how we can be more faithful to nature, to the universe. Now, in our reflective, meditative mode, 
let us turn towards our uh, sermon today, to be or not to be, being faithful to life or to worldly success. So you all know the quote, I think, therefore I am correct. Who, who said that? Descartes. Descartes, yes. And it's, it's a quote we, we hear from time to time. I don't know if we reflect too much on it, but for some reason, I, my feeling is toward it that we, it's sometimes a given, like, yes, that's why I am a being. But then, again, when we reflect a little more on it as I have this week, it begs the question, do trees exist? Do the pews, <laughs> the earth? Kind of a crazy set of questions, but it's, it seems to beg them. And I don't know, I think, yeah, <laughs> they do. It's, it's not just me, and it's not just those that I think are thinking uh, that are, but all things are. And maybe there's a little uh, more illumination uh, in this matter when we reflect on it from a spiritual light. Reflecting on how God infuses all things and God's wisdom is a part of all objects. But I think maybe a more affirming definition than uh, I think, therefore I am, uh, to define being is all that has form is, perhaps. Maybe there's a, an even better one out there in the audience. Thing. I ask you to reflect on what it means to exist and does that come with inalienable rights. Rights are very different than privilege, and yet we can squander our rights as well. Swedenborg, the unintentional uh, namesake of our denomination, the 18th century mystical thinker, uplifted this idea that even our spiritual reality has form. And I think it's helpful to turn towards thinkers like Swedenborg when we reflect on this because, you know, before I read Swedenborg, I didn't really think of my internal reality as having any real substance, having any real weight. And yet, theologians like Swedenborg and our scripture, our many scriptures throughout the world, in fact, point out that Spirit is more substance than what we often call substance. Heavier than material reality because it, it has a real weight in terms of our lives, in terms of the lives and reflections of all beings. Now before I go any further, are, is anyone having trouble hearing me? No? Oh, that's wonderful. Now, Although Swedenborg believed that the spiritual realm, our spiritual lives, have weight, even as we're in this life, not just once we die, he did believe that there were two generally opposing forces in the spiritual world. And one, actually, he categorizes as essentially nothing, at least from the Lord's perspective of eternity. And that is hurtfulness, that is hellishness, as we might say. That's the quality of hell that is nothing. Kind of an interesting thought, especially in such a world full of hurt and trauma, the things that I would probably categorize as kind of hellish. And yet they seem to also have their use too. We, we learn from our mistakes we grow from our bad habits if we're willing to, especially when we're willing to see them, reflect on our internal and external behavior, and also recognize that there is room to grow no matter how far we've come, because God empowers all our lives, all of our goodness, and growth. Now, Swedenborg didn't believe that this hell that was essentially nothing, in a way, was run by the personhood of Satan. 
He thought Satan in Scripture was more a metaphor for each of us often. Our willingness to be centered on nothingness, the things that don't serve creation's purpose, that actually break it down a little bit. The destructive aspects of spirit especially, which are harder to see how they may be used for good in the long run. We're often drawn by our destructive tendencies, this nothingness. So again, I find it weird that it could be called nothing. Weightless, transient even, passing. And yet it fills me with hope to think of those things that way. To think of them that way in myself, to think of them that way in society. That the reason even the heaviest, darkest moments of our past and of our histories is nothing is because in the long run, all return to God in one way or another. All are held in peace. Even those in hell, according to Swedenborg. Now, I, I want to take a moment to explore this idea of hell with you because it weighs pretty heavily on religion, this idea of hell. And uh, Emerson, who was quite the fan of Swedenborg, he, he wrote about Swedenborg uh, in his Representative Men series, which was, I think, only three men. Uh, uh, and one was Swedenborg. He called him the mystic. But he wasn't a fan of this idea of hell. I think he was more a universalist in the, in the strictest sense of the term. And yet, in a way, I think Swedenborg's idea of hell makes sense, so let me know if it makes sense to you. Often we get caught up in our hellishness, our nothingness, our selfishness. We give it weight. Our spirit thinks it is us, even. We identify with our hurtful practices, and we even uplift them in others to further our selfish goals, to further the pain that we feel uh, is seductive, is wonderful. And Swedenborg believed that that could continue into the next life. Clearly we die at some point, at least uh, most of us. And Swedenborg believed God couldn't just flip a switch and erase our hurtfulness just because she wants to. We see it in our world today. God doesn't just flip the switch. If God could do it once we die because we're Christian or because uh, X, Y, or Z, then why not do it on this earth? Because God, I believe, appreciates our freedom. In fact, is centered on our ability to choose. Because God is all about life. And the life of God is a free life, a truly open, supportive, and wise life, yes, but free even more so because God shuns destructiveness and hurtfulness, hate. We hear it in our scripture all the time, God despises this, God despises that, hates the wicked. So it's hard to read sometimes, especially when it's not attributed to, to hurtful people in the general sense. It, maybe, maybe it's something like, go destroy all the Canaanites. All of these people you find, O Israel, wipe them from the face of the earth, man, woman, child, animal. That's hard. Hard to carry a uh, holy text that seems to sometimes be centered on nothing, on hurt and hell. And yet when we start to draw the lines within the text, which really blows my mind, we start to see that the, the text is more alive than we often give it credit for. Even when it turns 
us against something that sounds at least fairly wholesome, like the Canaanites, like another set of people, it often defines those people in very negative terms. I know it's not much to go on. But I think if we take it a little bit deeper, then it's even easier to see the life there. To see why we should shun the wickedness within ourselves, perhaps. Not those we call wicked, those especially that we despise just because they're strange or different, have varying beliefs. But that we actually take very seriously this idea that nothingness isn't good for us. Hellishness, wickedness is hurtful as long as we stay in it. And so turning against it within ourselves, in a sense, makes sense. It's funny, though, on an even deeper level, Swedenborg would say shunning something, hating something, isn't really about hate in, on the spiritual plane. It's about removing it. It's about being disciplined, being faithful to life, and walking away. It's interesting, because Swedenborg says that the literal this of scripture often speaks the context of the people, but also how we often feel, how we project our feelings, because our scriptures were spoken, were written through other people, through communities. And so we characterize God as angry. In fact, he says it. I am not angry. It's you who are angry. I am never angry. And yet, there are other scriptures that say, well, no, God is, is angry. God is destructive. God wants this, that. In a way, that spiritual sense, that deeper understanding of what it means to shun hurtfulness, to shun nothingness, is a call to faithfulness in and of itself. It's about each of our lives. So I ask you, what is our nothingness in practice, if I may be so bold? Well, often it's this addiction to success, to domination and vanity. The worldliness that we hear despised in Scripture, I think, is characterized not as the world in general, not as a blanket condemnation as we sometimes read it as, but as a type of centeredness. We can be centered on the world, our reputation, the, the passing vanity, our judgment of others, our defensiveness. It takes many forms. And yet I like this word or this phrase, worldly success. It's a type of addiction, I think, in today's world, I, I feel it in myself often. It's something that I think we each may grapple with. Really, it's a worship of ourself. It's a, it's a centeredness on the only life that we think matters, our own. We know that we think. We experience our affections, and so we feel it's natural to be centered on ourselves in such a way above other people, above God and creation. And yet we're warned against it again and again. On the flip side, the substantial part of us is faithfulness. It's the life within. Them. It's always with us, even when we think it's not. Even with those in hell, according to Swedenborg, God works to keep them from digging forever. God is always present with them, intrinsic in every detail. It's kind of amazing, really. In fact, he has a chapter in his book, Heaven and Hell. I think it's the first chapter of the very small part at the back that's about hell. And it's titled, The Lord Governs the Hells. It's not always how we think about hell. That it could be the best that 
those people continue to choose. It could be still infused with divinity and life and love in its own way, despite the nothingness that it tries to center on, the destructiveness that we feel we love. And I think we each have a semblance of, of God's faithfulness to those people, to each of us and ourselves. To reverse the polarity of being centered on our own lives and find ways to see that we are all enlivened by the same God, that we are all a shared life, in a sense, from divinity. When we start to acknowledge that the beauty of the world, the weight of each other's spirits, is the same substance and form that gives life to us, and that that in ourselves is also from the one God that's shared throughout tradition, shared throughout faiths, often shared with those who believe they have no faith, but center themselves on goodness and life in their own way. As we realize that sharedness, that divinity and dwelling in each of us and all things, I think it becomes easier to be faithful, to connect, to want to connect, to hear God in the little moments, knowing that God's all around. To be more compassionate. You know, I think throughout my life, I've sometimes lacked compassion. I think in a way we all lack everything good, in a sense, if God is all goodness, infinite goodness, we always have room to grow, but especially, I think, when I think about my younger years, sometimes I didn't care about other people in the way that I should. I was hard-hearted. I only saw life in myself, and that life might have been centered on nothing, on destructiveness. But leaning into faithfulness, compassion for other people and ourselves, for, for the world around us, nature, is truly living we start to find that it brings a peace that we actually were yearning for before. Sometimes it's hard because it doesn't have the high of success. We don't feel that draw of seduction, of wealth, power, domination, hurt. There's a type of seductiveness to it, it's, it's true. Especially if we're in it. And sometimes being faithful to life, being respectful of others, being loving and compassionate, whatever our first step is in that path, sometimes feels like a drag, a little too peaceful. Not much is going on, like, no, this is nothing. What are you talking about? No, this is destructive to my life. I was having fun before. We can easily turn things around and still know that it's not serving other people. That's not what we care about. And ultimately, our lives are still at the center. We have to be faithful to our life and to our family and our communities. But being aware of these deeper interconnectedness, this deeper reality of shared living, sheds light on how to be faithful even to ourselves. Finding self-care, having time to uplift your own spirit helps you be faithful to others. It all takes different forms, our faithfulness. We are each in a deep relationship with God and our earth. We're called to listen to how God is speaking to us in every moment, even. It may seem far-fetched. But just as I find in Scripture, the more we seek God in it, 
not being duped, not just taking it for face value sake because someone said it's scripture, but the more we look into the things that have spoken to us in the past, that we have good reason to believe divinity is present in, the more we start to see the interconnectedness that is there. Especially in life, because how could God not be? How could our higher power not be present, uplifting faithfulness? And so, I ask each of you, find faithfulness in your life in new ways. Find the aspects of yourself that you sometimes have trouble reflecting on, might be hard to own up to. Because we like that feeling of success, the high of nothingness. And yet, success has its place. Success is also transformed, just as we can be, as we center it on life. Now let's take a few moments, closing our eyes and opening our hands if we feel so called, taking taking four to five deep breaths, We're finding in studies that four second breath in, four second south helps to calm us throughout the day. Cold water breathing. A longer breath out, up to eight seconds, can help us settle even further before sleep. When we find our nerves on edge, when we feel draw towards our addictions. Well, with that, uh, let us take a moment to uh, reconnect with our bodies. Placing our spine in a neutral position is actually quite helpful in all uh, the movements that we make. So, you know, thinking about our spirit, how, how we can align that towards health, but also our physicality. Taking a few deep breaths as we continue to reflect on our topic. It's nice to uh, move a little bit, lean into dance sometimes. And uh, perhaps you're willing to move a little bit as we listen to uh, a song by uh, David Fekety, Reverend David Fekety. Uh, and as we also uh, move, let us pray, turning towards the prayerful posture of uh, contemplation and meditation. Uh, we don't always combine these things, but you know, if I'm assuming you're in a place where you'll feel comfortable moving, and if not, maybe this is uh, a challenge for you to uh, break out of the current mold, to be faithful to what uh, you may or may not feel called to do. If you don't feel called to, to it, then don't do it. Now, here is David Fekety as we turn towards prayerful motion.
As we continue our prayerful posture, let us listen to a, another song, uh, this one by Paul Deming. The heavens are telling the glories of God. the fullness thereof, and we are the saints of the King. So cry out, cry out, O Zion, cry out, cry out to the King. Lift your voice and shout, O Zion, lift up His banner and If we do not praise Him, the rocks will cry out. But I will not be put to shame. For we are rehearsing a heavenly shout. By praising and praising His name. So cry out, cry out. dust of this world, break loose the vines and be free, shake loose your worries and fears, lift up your eyes and see, and see, the heavens are telling the glories of God. And the fullness thereof And we are the saints of the King So cry out, cry out, O Zion Cry out, cry out to the King Lift your voice and shout, O Zion Lift up His banner and sing So cry out, cry out, 
Heavenly One, we turn to you with our concerns, lamentations, and uh, gratitude. We open our hearts to how you're speaking to us today. Help us remember to be faithful to your presence, to be faithful to your presence within and around us, as you are always faithful to ours, working so diligently in all the details of life to uplift us, to empower us, and to become closer to us. Thank you, God, for that. Today we are faced with many tragedies in the world stage and the news, from mass shootings to war to uh, deeply distorted systems, uh, systems that don't work for most people, uh, inequality that puts pressure on the poorest of us. And as you tell us what we do to the least of these, we do to you. Help us to remember that, to take that seriously, and to be faithful to your call to transform the ways we've done things and to make this truly a heaven on earth. For you are not a dead God, you are alive in each of us, truly living in yourself. So help us to receive your empowerment, your strength, to make changes that sometimes seem impossible given how we sometimes are, given how the world sometimes is. Thank you, Lord. We rejoice at your promise of salvation, your call and pull towards true substance of uh, salvation, life. Sometimes we lose track of what it means to live and we condemn others. We uh, hope to dominate, hope to misuse our religion um, for our own selfish purposes, for our own pride, arrogance, and glory. But as you remarked, uh, in your worldly life as, as Christ, as you remark in many other scriptures throughout the world, we are called to, to openness, to humility, and to humble our spirits to truly uh, find the life in faithfulness, find the joy and peace that it brings beyond all imagination. In your heavenly name we pray, however we say it. Amen. Well, thanks, folks. Thanks for joining us today with uh, the Swedenborgian Online Community Sunday evening reflection service. If you're interested in uh, more on this topic, I invite you to read uh, the posted sermon from this morning at swedenborgiancommunity.org. It is uh, quite different than what you heard, as it usually, or what it tends to be. Uh, and if you have any thoughts about any of this, again, reach out, connect with those in community. There's a number of discussion areas, both on the website, on Facebook, uh, so find us there. And uh, truly, uh, be true to yourself, be faithful to that higher calling, your higher self, truly. Uh, and also know that you are one with all others. Uh, the, the judgment, the separation, and the anxiety that you feel uh, is, is fleeting if you let it flee. And finally, go forth knowing that you are quite loved.